planning a trip like this six months in advance, it fills you with a sense of excitement about the places that you're about to explore. Anticipation about the experiences that you're about to share. And even a little bit of anxiety about the challenges that you're going to face along the way. Eventually though, all of that fades to the background because after six months of planning, the day comes and it's time for the trip to begin. My trip wouldn't actually start on the motorcycle though since it had already been hauled out two weeks prior to my arrival. Instead I needed to get up really early, catch an Uber and head to the airport where I was meeting up with Classio. Classio and I would jump on a flight from O'Hare out to Denver, Colorado, which was pretty uneventful. Once we landed, we'd quickly jump in an Uber and head over to Colorado Motorcycle Adventures, where our bikes had been in storage for the weeks leading up to this trip. It was here that we'd meet up with John C., the third member of this overall riding group, but there was one more. We wouldn't meet up with him, though, until we made it out to Bags, Wyoming. Given everything that was going on up before this trip, at this moment, it just feels 100% unbelievable that my bike is here, that I'm here, and that we're, like, doing this ride, you know? Yep, I agree. Although it was pavement, even a ride out to Bags wouldn't be uneventful. Traffic soon slowed to a grinding halt, which caused both of the KTMs to simultaneously overheat. We pulled over to the side of the road to give both of them a chance to cool off before continuing on. This worked out well because then traffic started to open up and the rest of the trip was relatively uneventful. It wouldn't be long before we'd make our arrival at the luxurious Cowboy Inn or accommodations for the evening. It was here we'd grab a quick bite to eat and then get to bed early so that we were nice and rested for the following day's ride. Okay, now that everybody's together, let's make introductions. First up is John C., the logistical wizard and mastermind behind this whole trip. Then there's Classu. As you can tell from the dirt on that KTM 990, he likes riding off-road. Then there's John F., the only guy I know that can ride a KTM 350 these kind of distances. And then last but not least, yours truly. This is everyone together at the official start. While all the bikes are still upright, pristine, in working order, and so are all of the riders. We decided to run the route from north to south just for logistical reasons, which is the opposite of what most people do. This meant that our day one would only be 87 miles in length and put us into Steamboat Springs early afternoon. The riding was relatively easy with smooth terrain and beautiful scenery along the way. However, arriving this early at Steamboat Springs would mean that we'd be sitting around at a campsite in the baking heat all afternoon. None of us had any desire to do this, so we decided to go ahead and get a jump start on the following day's ride. This led to some of the most beautiful scenery we've seen, at least so far. So we stopped for a moment to take it all in before heading back out on the road. The view from the gravel was just as beautiful as the stop along the side of the road. A few gravel corners and we were on to pavement, but little did we know as we made this left turn onto the paved surface what was about to happen. As we entered the corner, John Lowe sighted right in front of me. For a moment, I thought for sure I was going to run him over. All right. Hey, I'm fine. Okay. I mean, it's not beyond repair. Okay. Huh? Oh, I don't know. I didn't try. I didn't try. No. We managed to rig together a makeshift foot peg out of some of the tools from one of the KTM toolkits. This was pretty kludgy, but it managed to get us back to Steamboat Springs. It was here that we'd find our lodging for the evening, the Rabbit Ears Motel, which quickly became known as the Playboy Mansion for the rest of the trip. Although we were able to make most of the repairs ourselves, there was still one major one left over. The foot peg was broken pretty badly, and if we couldn't find someone local to fix it, it could be the end of the trip for John C. 
The morning was filled with anxiety because we were able to find a local fabrication shop, but this is really the last chance and hope to make sure that John C. could make the rest of the trip. If this guy couldn't manage to reattach the foot peg and get the bike to stand upright on the kickstand, it was game over. Lucky for us, this guy was up for the job and made quick work of both aspects. The ride was going to continue. We had to make a few small minor adjustments once back at the hotel, but then we were ready for the day's ride. It didn't take long and we were back in our happy place, which was gravel and fire and dirt roads riding through the woods with clear blue skies. We came across some water crossings and even some wildlife, and I think everybody was really starting to feel like this trip was coming together. It was a little bit of a sketchy beginning, but things were looking up. The views seem to get better and better with each and every turn, but as you'll see as we continue forward that this will be a recurring theme throughout the entire trip. Each time you pass something absolutely gorgeous and you think to yourself it can't get any better, it does. It wouldn't be long before we make a quick stop for snacks and get something to drink before continuing our path onto gypsum where we would run into the infamous silt beds. We were back on the road and after you've done any amount of riding in Colorado, you quickly learn that the weather can be rather unpredictable and change very rapidly. It gets to a point though where you don't think twice about it, you just ride through it. The only concern here is that we were making our way to those infamous gypsum silt beds and we weren't exactly sure what the moisture would do to that surface, but we'd soon find out. Now it's a bit difficult to try and explain exactly what it's like to ride on this stuff, but it's much what I would imagine the moon or Mars to be like. It is just so soft and slippery that it is unbelievable. And as you ride through it, the person in front of you goes through something and just kicks up a massive cloud of dust. This happened to class you, but at the same time happened to me behind the two of them, and I quickly found myself on the ground. I sat there waiting for somebody to circle back, which I knew they would, and it wasn't long before class you arrived. But then as he was coming back, he managed to drop his bike, and it was stuck, so the whole thing turned into quite the fiasco. However, after some exerted energy and some heavy lifting, we were turned back around and on our way to catch up with John C. and John F. Now, little did we know that while we were doing this, those two were having their own little fiasco up ahead. We'd find that out soon enough as we rode through the unseeable future with John F. waving like a madman and no idea what he was trying to communicate. Apparently there was a deep rut just below the sill, but luckily I'd made it through and then we just had to go back and fix John F's bike after his bags had fallen off. That stop section right yeah. there? Yeah. I'm right behind John. I'm right behind John. Get that section. Wow. Yeah. As we got ready to go, a new problem developed. I couldn't find one of my gloves, but I went ahead and I borrowed one of Class U's and we continued on. The silt started to turn to gravel and we were quickly making our way to Gypsum, the end of a fantastic day of riding. Wow, yes, town of Gypsum. And let me just say, what an amazing day. What an amazing, amazing day. So spirits were obviously high, we had plenty of time. Camp was only four miles away and we had plenty of time for dinner. Little did we know though, this shell station was about to be our home for the next couple of hours. As we got ready to leave and head to dinner, the trusty old F-800 simply refused to start. So apparently, BMW uses this little bitty Torx head and a somewhat flawed design in that kill switch that is known apparently on the internet 
that we now have to take it apart. There's some little white pin we take out, and then it'll fix this problem. But it did require a KTM making two separate trips to the hardware store to get the tools needed to fix the BMW. But KTMs aren't without their flaws either. KTMs do tend to lose their mirrors. <laughs> so, you know, take your pick, falling off mirrors or kill switches, your choice. But we're overheating, but we've got that covered already. So we've been here for about two hours now because the BMW kill switch would not start and it ended up being this tiny little white pain in the ass right here causing the problem. But we've got it fixed, we're in the middle of putting it back together and it'll be back on the road shortly. So the camp that was only four miles away we arrived at a mere 30 minutes later. Upon arrival, we'd quickly discover that, well, we couldn't camp there because it was closed and only workers were allowed. But we did find someone who told us that we could head back up the road the direction we came and find any little pull-off and camp there. Between the hard ground that didn't want to accept tent stakes and Klesu's fear of bears, justified or not, it wasn't setting up to be the best night's sleep, but it was going to have to make do. It was a great day, and tomorrow would be another for sure. I woke up in the morning not feeling so great. Let's just suffice it to say that an inch and a half thick thermarest didn't exactly provide the most cushion between me and that rock hard ground. Class, you had it a little bit rough too, given his fear of bears, but. We soon found something to have a good laugh about that cheered us all up and got us ready for the day's ride. You remember that glove that I lost yesterday? Well, we were about to find it. <laughs> that, that's the, uh, the built-in uh, glove holder feature. That's what that is. Melted to the... <laughs> So with a good laugh out of the way, we were starting the day's ride and it was sure to be interesting because one of the early stops on today's route was going to be the Continental Divide. As we continued our climb up to the lookout point, I was again thankful that I had decided to go with the KTM for this ride. The bike was handling great, the views were phenomenal, the riding was fun, and everybody was enjoying themselves. As we continued to climb through the elevation changes, the rocks seemed to get bigger every step of the way, but then again, that's what these bikes are made for, and this really is the epitome of adventure riding. I was thankful that I had the suspension travel and the low-end grunt that I had, although I would soon be proven wrong that that was a necessity to make it up through this climb. That's because it was up here at this overlook that we first encountered this young gentleman on his ATK along with Lisa and Peter. Lisa and Peter along with the gentleman on the ATK would all continue to intertwine with us throughout the rest of the route. So their stories become part of ours and it was a real pleasure to meet all of them. We started our descent and we were headed to Leadville where we'd be making our lunch stop and that was really good for me because by now I wasn't sure if it was the elevation sickness or the poor night's sleep given the rocky ground but I was not feeling well at all and I was really looking forward to and hoping that lunch would fix the problem. Unfortunately, lunch didn't help a whole lot and I still wasn't feeling well and we were approaching a long sand section that I wasn't exactly looking forward to. However, I had somewhat luck out here even though it disappointed the other guys that when we arrived the gate was closed and we couldn't pass through. So we found ourselves back on the main road and on the pavement, which is not an adventure rider's favorite place to be, but we were quickly making our way to Buena Vista, and after a conversation at one of our stops, the guys had decided that they would go ahead and accommodate me not feeling well and get a hotel for the evening instead of trying to find a campsite. I was extremely grateful for this because I really needed a good night's rest. 
After crashing extremely hard and really early, I woke up feeling 100% better and completely refreshed. I was extremely thankful for the guys accommodating me and it was really looking up because this was the middle part of the trip which offers some of the most phenomenal riding. However, before we could get to that, we'd have to deal with our daily dose of bike issues. One of these fell out and uh... Dave's gonna go buy another one down at the East Hardware Store. Very well. Yeah, I'll walk you up. You got the original, right? Yeah. Yep. Might be. Do you have sockets? You want my end A tenor. Probably the second or third minor, minor issue that we've had with the KTM. We lost a pinch bolt. But unlike the BMW that requires multiple trips and all these special tools, we just run to the local hardware store, buy the random bolt that they have off the shelf, put it in there, and in minutes, the KTM is back on the road. In minutes, not hours. We won't be here till noon. So after poking fun, the BMW did need a little bit of work, but it was just minor adjustments to make the ship lever more comfortable for John C. However, as we exited the gas station, we quickly realized that the drama wasn't yet over for the morning. Class U quickly realized that he'd left something pretty important back at the gas station, his eyeglasses. Without these, it would be a pretty rough day, so he circled back and the chances of finding them were pretty slim. But surprisingly to all of us, a few minutes later, he arrived back and told us that he had managed to find them on the ground. So we were all good to go and we could finally start the day's ride. I think the combination of a really good night's rest, as well as knowing that these days were starting to build to the peak of this trip, but it just seemed to click and align with the terrain that we were riding through. It seemed to get more and more interesting and more and more challenging all throughout the day. For a small portion, I decided that I would go ahead and take the lead and do some of the navigation to alleviate some of the effort from the other guys. However, in doing so, I managed to guide us down a wrong turn. On a trip like this, wrong turns somehow seemed to turn into opportunity. This opportunity in particular was a great one because it was this really cool hill climb. You're riding along a rocky, loose surface and you're managing traction carefully, clutching and gassing and controlling your weight distribution to try and get enough grip to continue momentum up the hill. There are some turns along the way and all of this just creates an exciting and challenging experience. Everyone made it and we had a good laugh about the wrong turn, realizing that we just have to turn around and go back down. But before we do that, we'd take a quick moment to stop and take in and enjoy this beautiful scenic overlook. As we made our way back down the hill, it occurred to me that not only were we about halfway through the day's ride, but we were also over halfway through the entire trip. The time flies by so quickly with so many things happening every single day. This thought can start to overwhelm you because you realize that, like all things, this trip will have to come to an end. But then you have to let go of that because it's not at an end yet and there's still plenty more to see and enjoy. So I quickly let go of this thought process and instead just looked around until we encountered the local wildlife blocking the road almost as if to force us to appreciate our surroundings. So after this chance encounter it was back to regular ride mode with all those thoughts out of my head and just enjoying every step of the way. We were quickly making our way towards Lake City where we had plans to camp again that night. However, as we arrived, this is a very popular area and it was very difficult to try and find a camping spot, at least one comfortable enough to sleep on. So we headed into town to see if maybe we could find some lodging in some other form or fashion. 
It was here we discover this beautiful little gem that just happened to have one lodge available that would accommodate all four of us. So without hesitation we promptly checked in and then discovered that the lodge also had a stove. This subsequently led to a fantastic idea of going back into town, picking up some groceries and cooking in. John C. quickly volunteered for this task and we were all grateful. He made a fantastic meal, there was good conversation and reminiscing about the day's ride, including a visit from the lodge owner, who proceeded to go ahead and give us a warning about how to lock the windows to keep the bears out, so maybe Klesu's fear of bears was justified after all. He also heeded one other warning about Black Bear Pass, and we were potentially doing that the following day. So we turned in for the evening and got prepared for the next day's ride, which was sure to be exciting. If there was one day on this ride that was going to be the day, the climactic day, this was sure to be it. We were going to be hitting more passes in this day than any other day throughout the entire trip. Our history told us though that it was now a good idea to take the start of the day and go through all the bikes with a fine tooth comb before starting the ride. After an amazing morning's ride, we arrived at the Animas Forks Ghost Town. This historic site offers some absolutely stunning views and plenty to go around and see, so we took a few moments and spent some time wandering around, going in and out of the buildings and just taking it all in. As we left this historic site, a thought occurred to me that we hadn't had any bike problems at all today. This was a good thing because the day filled with so many passes, the terrain itself presented enough challenges, the last thing we needed was any mechanicals to go along with it. As we continued forward, the volume of traffic seemed to constantly increase. This was surely an indication that we were getting into the most interesting terrain out of the whole trip.
The fact that you are here is just incredible. Great job. So, if you were standing there, I wasn't in the but and the guy is like, he's, he's, in, right at me. he's in the corner, okay, and you know, if I'm on the top watching, he's in the corner, and in the middle, around where you guys saw us, he took off from the corner, and he had no way of coming to him at the side. You guys were looking good, huh? you know, yeah, rolling yeah, down there. Yeah. 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 Did you take that uh, extra loop through? Yeah. yeah. Nice With the gates? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, before that, I kept complaining. Like, oh, you know, it's going to be all highway. Uh, <laughs> I was even the highway. Yes, the, the landslide was on the way down. All the this one was dirt. nice, you know. On the way down, it was uh, the cross too. Yeah. It was that, all dirt. It was all dirt. dirt. They had a landslide like only five days ago. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah, you're right a there. guy told us, so they just cleaned it up. So the downhill on the corpse this one is the corpse. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, it was all dirt. Oh, nice. it was, yeah, it was all. We had plenty of time. Nice. Particularly some of those really tight things back. You know, it's just amazing that we met them. I can't even remember where it was. I think it was like day two. Day two, day three, something like that. And uh, at the 12,000 foot uh, overlook. And, you know, here we are. And the fact that the, they're a couple, they're riding together, and just rode all the same stuff that we just did, sections, sections of which had me queasy. It's phenomenal. I mean, such a, a, an inspiring story, I think to see a, a couple out doing a trip like this and you know just smiles and you know happiness I, I mean and they met 30 years ago through motorcycling that's what's in Turkey you know I mean the, the stories and the people that you meet that's such a big big part of you know this type of a trip and Man, just hats off to them. What a, what a great couple. Okay, so we've arrived at Black Bear Pass. And it looks like we are going to do it. Not sure what to expect. There's been so many stories talked about the guy at the lodge. Apparently it is pretty spectacular, but I guess there is a small section that's pretty sketchy, so, wow. Just look at that though. Coming up on the right! So we're headed down to this section of Black Bear Pass that everybody keeps talking about. Could be a cliff, could be a creek, rock face, we don't know. Um, but apparently it's not too far up here. And we're going to go check it out.
This was it. We had arrived at the infamous rock ledge, and it was every bit as terrifying as all the stories that people had been telling us along our way. The width was now exactly that of a jeep and not a foot wider. Yeah, you threw me in the middle, into the middle. Right. Uh. Well, that's gonna be a lot of work now. Let's put in neutral. You had it, dude. Huh? I had, but the suspension went all the way down. And then went through the handlebars. All right. You need to get help. Oh, Dawson. Don't do any work now. Wait, wait, John. I'm okay, the bike not. We're gonna need help here, Dave. I can't even describe how much effort and energy it takes just to walk up this hill and make our way back to help Class Hugh and John F. get this bike out of its current predicament. Hold on. No, no, it's not neutral yet. Okay. Okay, now it is. Hold on, hold on. Let me let me just remove the side stand. We want me to and then pull back. You got the front brake. All right, here we go. Two, three, go. Whoa. All right. Got it. Hold it. All right, got it. Well, let's try. Let's do it. Well, oh, oh. I'm using, I'm using. Let's go walking like that. My concern is only the edge right there. All right. Let it drop each leg. Hold on. I think I'm gonna go to, yeah, You're right there. Uh -huh. oh, hold on, hold on. Where? I think I'm gonna go straight now. I'm already here. But I'm gonna lose my foot here, so you guys help. Uh huh. I will not. Right here. I'm gonna keep the same line against the wall. That's what I'm gonna do. Alright. Yeah, I'm good now. Alright, man. After exerting all of that energy, it was difficult to try and find the capacity left to enjoy the absolutely stunning scenery that was around us. At this point in time, I'll be honest, there were only two thoughts that were crossing my mind, and they were basically food and water. Two things we had been without for a significant amount of time, and the effects of which were becoming obvious in the riding. Your motions just seem to happen a little bit slower, the bike feels a little bit heavier, and doesn't steer quite as quickly. 
all the while you're riding along and that right hand edge somehow seems to have a gravitational pull to it. One that's imaginary but might as well be real because of the effect that it has on your riding. It forces you to hug that inside line as if your life depended on it, which I guess, in a sense, it kind of does. Although it's not as dramatic as it seems, there's no way you can tell yourself that while you're in the middle of it. As you ride along, there's not an opportunity to look over your shoulder and keep an eye on everyone. So we had to make a quick stop and just ensure that Klesu wasn't getting too far behind or having any problems. After a moment's pause, he was caught up and we'd resume riding from there. Just down below was Telluride, which seemed like an oasis in the middle of a desert and I just couldn't wait to reach it. As we resumed the ride, I hugged a little too close and clipped the saddlebag on a rock which pushed me towards that edge that had been calling my name exactly what I didn't want to do. This resulted in a lump in my throat about the size of a pineapple and I just found it hard to breathe. But you have to force yourself to refocus your attention because this road demands it. One small wrong deflection from a rock and you could have a very bad day really quickly. John F. was up front leading the way, and much like a shepherd, he was keeping an eye on his flock, guiding us each and every step of the way and telling us which lines to take. As small as this effort may seem, the impact of it was significant. Not only did it help me to actually make it through the corner, but it also started to rebuild my confidence that we were actually going to get to the bottom of this thing. About this point in time, Telluride felt like a mirage, and we had gotten there, but it just disappeared. Luckily, with this teamwork and the continued descent, it started to feel like it was actually there, and we were going to make it. As we continued our descent, the grade became less and less steep, which gave me confidence that it wasn't that far away. As we inched our way closer and closer, I could feel that I started having a little more capacity to pay attention to some of the surroundings. There wasn't that constant fear of the ledge, and you could actually sit back and appreciate things like this beautiful waterfall. We inched closer and closer, and you could feel that Telluride had finally become a reality. As we made our way into town, Telluride can be quite busy, but we managed to find accommodations for the evening and a good restaurant to get something to eat. The view from downtown offered us a different perspective of where we had just been. Yet another beautiful place that we'd be spending the night, and we managed to fit in a gondola ride to close out the evening, where we'd encounter two of the guys that we had met on Black Bear Pass earlier in the day which was a great end to a really long and difficult day. Day 7 would start with a little bit of sorrow since it was obvious that this trip was nearing its end. We weren't exactly sure what to expect from the train for today's ride, but we knew that most things would pale in comparison to what the previous day had offered. We'd find ourselves pleasantly surprised though because soon we were back onto these nice forest roads covered in dirt with scenic views along the way. This really reminded me of the first couple of days of the trip and certainly not quite as exciting as the previous day but still enjoyable nonetheless. The forest roads would soon open up and make way for gravel roads but even gravel roads aren't paved and we had our share of cattle guard crossings. This was an indication that we weren't necessarily done with all the off-road riding as of yet. We'd find ourselves making another turn and headed back into the forest roads once again. These dirt covered roads, but without the cliff begging you to fall off of it, really made for an enjoyable time for me. I found myself just having a blast, giving it a little bit of gas over each one of these little ridges and enjoying the front wheel getting light along the way. 
one of those playful little things that you can just have fun with and do on an adventure bike. As we traveled along here, it just seemed as if the route somehow knew that we might be concerned with the ride coming to an end and presented us with that grand finale of off-road enjoyment. The further we went, the more fun I was having. This is a nice break actually from the day before. This more flowing stuff that you could play with and have fun with was just leading to a really good time. The hours were passing by quickly and it didn't even occur to me that we were just creeping that much closer to the end of the trip. We'd approach each one of these cattle guard crossings with a little bit of caution because although most of them were open, occasionally we would encounter one that was closed. John F. jumped off and offered to open up the gate. Class you might have been a little bit anxious because as soon as he got an opening big enough, Class was on his way through. JC followed but got a little bit hung up on the gate itself. John F. replaced it once we were all through and we continued on the ride. This style path seemed to go on forever and that was okay by me. However, as we traveled through it, there were a few little hiccups along the way. Class U managed to bottom his suspension on one of the larger bumps that the front end came down hard on. It wasn't too bad, but the fork seals did start to leak and we'd have to later address this. But we went ahead and proceeded forward anyway. We'd spend a little bit more time in this off-road section before eventually hitting the pavement. Remember how I said earlier that we'd been pretty fortunate about bike repairs and a day had elapsed where we hadn't made any? Well, that was all about to change. Shortly after we got to the pavement, Klesu quickly realized that he had a rear flat. I'd rather do that by myself. Have you done it before? Yeah. I'd say between five and ten minutes. It's okay. <laughs> we got you. Yep. It did take more than 10 minutes in order to get that tire changed, but it still wouldn't be long before we'd be back on the road and headed towards Cortez. However, once we'd arrive in Cortez, we'd still have some bike repairs to do in the parking lot before we could call it a day. So, we've got a leaky fork seal here on the 990, and we're hoping that we can get away with Oh boy, I don't think so. It is leaking bad. We're going to try and do the trick where you cut a bottle and then you run it inside of the seal to clear out any dirt that might be in there. Um, I don't think it's going to fix it, but hopefully, if nothing else, it'll slow it down so that then the highway miles that we have remaining back to Denver uh, won't be as bad. Luckily, this happened right at the end of the off-road bits, so we're pretty fortunate there. With the fork seals all ready for the next day's ride back to Denver, we finished packing up the bikes and called it a night. We had a long road ride ahead of us tomorrow morning. We woke up early to ensure we could meet our timelines for the last and final day of riding. See, we had to get Classy's motorcycle back to Colorado Motorcycle Adventures, the place where this whole trip began eight days ago. And we needed to do this before they closed for the day, otherwise logistically it would throw off all of our plans. He was jumping on a flight this evening and there'd be no other opportunity to get his bike over there. So it did put a little bit of time pressure on us for the ride back, but we still had time on that ride to think through about the things that had happened and transpired over the past eight days. That time seemed to go by so quickly, it feels like only yesterday that we started this whole trip. 
But you ride along and you think about the fact that you were fortunate enough to be able to do a trip like this and that's all that really matters. You hope there's an opportunity for another one someday in the future and we'll go ahead and start planning accordingly. But you just take a moment and accept that this particular one is in fact coming to an end and that that's okay because the memories and the experiences that you've had won't fade from your mind anytime soon. Although most of the trip back had been uneventful, it seemed as though our adventure riding still had one last thing to throw at us before we were done. Some severe weather. We wound up hitting some rain and some sleet and sideways rain on the way back all of which applied a little bit more pressure because we had to make it back in time to get Classy's bike there. Time was quickly running out and we couldn't exactly pick up the pace in these conditions. So we just slugged along and made our way and luckily it all worked out. We managed to get to Colorado Motorcycle Adventures just before they closed. This destination would put us at the end of our trip and a fantastic ride, back where it all started. Eight days, four guys, and some phenomenal riding. Who can complain?